Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, August 28, 2014, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week, man, do I have some stuff to cover. I was busy doing the slides up until about a minute ago, so I'm going to go ahead and get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. The makers of Mountain Dew do not compensate me for this endorsement, but I'm trying. Come on, PepsiCo. You can do it. Anyway. Don't have time for the business settle today. We gotta get busy. Alright, there's a disclaimer screen. You know the routine. Let me just sum it up for you. All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. And you know today we're gonna to talk quite a bit about the stuff that happens between now and then and how to deal with it. But before I get too far ahead of myself, do me a favor, throw me a bone, put me a review on Amazon.com if you read the Layman's Guide to Trading Stocks, which I assume you have, and you liked it. The um, reason I ask, as I say each week, or often I should say, is that sometimes somebody will review the reviews and not bother to read the book. And one guy, which it wasn't too horrible review, was like a, um, oh, I don't know, uh, he kind of ripped me a little bit of a new one, he gave me a three out of five and said, uh, it's work. Well, guess what? It is work. You know? Did you work, go to med school, become a doctor, and, and all of a sudden you're like, wow, this doctor thing is work. Become an engineer? What, you mean I actually have to figure out how to build a bridge? That's work. So anything worthwhile doing is worth working hard at and doing it right. All right, what do we talk about? Well, let's not spend too much time on the, what we could talk about. But I do want to talk a little bit about changing plans and to put a question mark on that. I've got some, a very interesting email, and I want to work through whether or not you should change plans. Permanent income hypothesis. This market, as I have said quite a bit for quite a long time, has been a bad teacher, okay? And the market's always really a bad teacher if you think about it. But it's like a new round of people come in, and I guess I'm just, I'm just becoming an old fart because <laughs> I'm starting to get cantankerous, and I'm like, you people have no idea. You haven't been around long enough. You haven't had, and I hate to say it, but you haven't had your ass handed to you yet. So you have no idea what can happen in the markets. But there are some people out there trading some momentum stuff and all. And, you know, that's what I trade. God bless you. Okay? Um, but you think it's always going to be like that, and it's not. And we'll get into that. Uh, we got yet another dead money report. I'm going to do a little bit more about um, obsessed before. Michael did computer chip design. Wow. Wow. God bless you, Michael. You're probably too smart to trade, so um, just be careful. <laughs> Uh, again, it's just before you get into the trade, not afterwards. We'll talk a little bit about that. This intertwined thing with uh, psychology, the methodology, and what's the third one? Psychology, methodology, oh, money management, okay? The intertwined nature of those three things, making that rope of success, strengthening that rope, a little analogy. I'm just loving that analogy. So I'm going to continue on on that theme, okay? Susan says, you're not going to give us 100% winners? <laughs> yeah, all the time. I mean, that's one thing, too, is this permanent income hypothesis, which we're going to get into in just a few minutes, which is kind of interesting. All right, the question was, we're short Mew. Mew. <laughs> um, I'm not bullish on Mew. And I got an email said the SMH made new highs. Why didn't you exit it, the stock? Well, let's take a look at that. We got a sell signal right around here on MU, made all-time highs, and it sold off fairly hard. It is kind of a thick stock, so it can be a little choppy, so you have to give it a little bit of a pass for being choppy. But it made a really nice gap down. Also, if you kind of squint your eyes, you can see it made a gap down here. And one of my patterns is reversal gap strategy, and that means that you wait for a market to make all-time highs, and then it has a gap down 
either the following day or within 10 days. Let's count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Bam, 11, okay? Close enough for government work, okay? So let's make that rule 10 or 11 days. See, this is why I'm a discretionary trader, okay? We're going to talk a little bit about discretion in a few minutes. Here's a good-looking signal, but I think my rules for that pattern are 10 days. Well, it happened on the 11th day. Close enough, right? But if you were trading mechanically, you would toss the signal out. Well, maybe in this case you should have tossed it out, but I digress. Anyway, it's also a first thrust, so even if you were um, a stickler on that, and you can see it pulled back in here. So it triggers somewhere in here. And initially it worked out pretty good, okay, at least for a day or two. And then, unfortunately, it turned around and went right back up, okay? So what do we do? Well, nothing. We have a stop in place. Oh, I made a little shark. Can you see that? Kind of like Derek Hobbs' little uh, shark bite, right? Um, we have a stop in place. And until we're stopped out, we're not going to do anything. Now, the question was, well, wait a minute. Semiconductors, bases the SMH, may do highs. Okay, why didn't you exit? Well, because we didn't get stopped out. Our plan was to enter this position, take partial profits at a certain level, and we'll take a look at the spreadsheet in a minute, and we'll figure out where that was because I can't remember it. Um, but have a stop in place just in case, okay? And the SMH may do highs. Well, okay, SMH may do highs, but you know the semiconductor index sort of did this, kind of stalled short of new highs. The Morningstar Semiconductor Index did that, okay? point I'm getting to there is, well, if you look at the SMH, but well, then you also need to look at the Morningstar Industry Semiconductors. And then, before you know it, you might want to look at a couple other things. Well, the point I'm trying to make is, it gets a little bit too complicated. But if your model says, I am going to short this one over here, X, and I'm going to use this sector Y, and if Y makes new highs, then I get out of X. That's fine. I don't care. My concern, though, is you could end up with too many moving parts, which I'll get to in just a minute, or analysis paralysis, where you really like a setup, but something keeps you from taking that setup. Don't get me wrong, ideally going in, you want the sector and the overall market and the stock all to be moving in the right direction. But sometimes you can't get that perfection and you have to be willing to take two out of three and sometimes even one out of three when that occurs if you really like the setup. Now, the point I'm trying to make is, or one of the points I'm trying to make is once you get in a trade, you can't add a rule. You can't add a rule because if you do, you're going to micromanage yourself out of a lot of positions. We've got two longs that are working. We've got one short that's working and one short that's not, that MU we just looked at. And during the period we entered those stocks, we had a sideways market. We had a market made new highs, and then we had a market that sold off. Okay, well, when it sold off, we should have got out of the longs, right? No. We followed the plan. We're still long the longs, those two longs at least, and we still short the shorts. So plan your trade and then just trade your plan. Obsess before you get into a trade and not afterwards. So don't come in here and add a rule saying, well, if the SMH makes new highs, now I'm going to go ahead and get out of this because it's not working. Now, I showed you, I'm kind of glad, let's go back a slide, I'm kind of glad this trade is not working right now. I mean, not personally, I wish it was working personally, don't get me wrong. But for educational purposes, I'm glad this trade is not working because it's either going to, it's going to provide, us a, provide us a lesson either way. Let's say this thing rolls over and becomes a big winner. Then I have yet another lesson of following the plan. I could show the importance of outliers. I could show the importance of discipline, etc. Now, if it goes on to stop out, well, you followed your plan. It stopped out. So either way, you get a lesson. You know, you're not getting results. Well, you're getting results. You just might not be getting good results, is what the uh, Tony Robbins of the world say. But I'm glad it's negative now. So just in case it goes positive, I could say, you see, following the plan is the way to go. 
Shorter term, micromanagement plays off, pays off. Excuse me. And that's one, there's so many things I want to talk about this week, but that's one of the things I want to talk about is seeing the forest for the trees. Because a lot of people go in and say, oh, I got out. Oh, look, that would have turned into a losing trade. I'm glad I got out. Oh, I got out. I got to get out. This is not acting properly. I'm at a loss. I'm going to get out. Okay, without letting that stop get hit. Well, you could do that, and you might save on 10 trades, but that 11th trade would have been the trade that would have made your entire year, okay? And not catching that big trade is going to really hurt your performance. So if you are always quitting, hey, I like this. If you're always quitting, you'll never be winning, okay? I like that. Let's write that down. If you're always quitting, you'll never be winning. You will micromanage yourself out of those trades. Dave, would you consider adding to the shoulder an MU? No. Um, but I have clients who sometimes will see a pattern within a pattern and um, and take it. Um, Phil, if he's in here, he likes the uh, he likes the throwbacks to the moving averages, and sometimes we'll have a short. And he'll just kind of watch it, retrace, and then he'll wait, and he'll take his, his trade up around the 50-day moving average. And that's worked out quite well. But one of my concerns about that is that might be one of those trees for the forest type of trades, okay, not seeing the forest. But, uh, no, I wouldn't add to it because because it's a better deal up here than it is down here, okay. If that, But if you have a pattern that you're trading and the pattern sets up, then by all means, trade it. Like Phil likes his 50-day moving average type of deal. That's his shtick. Then that's what he should do. Okay. Now, I've shown this a thousand times and I'll probably show it a thousand more. You've got the point one second before you enter a trade. Okay. I think that's probably the best way of doing it. Um, your finger is, let's say your finger's on its way down the millisecond before. And as soon as that finger touches that left click on that mouse, your trade goes through. And usually within a millisecond, you should be filled if you're trading a slightly liquid stock, or especially if you're trading an MU, you should get a report right back. But up until that millisecond before, everything in the world is known about that stock from a chart perspective. And furthermore, I even put in the S&P 500 in here. And notice this is the S&P 500 in the background. What's the S&P 500 doing? It's dying, okay? Had a little blip up. So did the stock. But the S&P 500 is looking ugly. Okay. Look at that right there. Okay. It's going uh, sideways. My cage just looked out. Look at that right there. Look right, right there. You can see it was going up. It went sideways. And then it began to tank. And it too was pulled up. So you got the market set up with you. So everything looks pretty darn good. Big smiley face here for a trade. That's the known. Okay, so you have a set of defined rules. If the stock fits your defined rules and you have certain things you also like to look at, like the market, well, in this case, the market confirms and the sector confirmed too, if memory serves. I think it did. So what do you do? Well, you decide that it's going to be a go. You take the trade. If you're not really crazy about the setup based on your rules and the market's going sideways and chopping around and the sectors chopping around or going the opposite way then you don't take the trade so everything is known you either decide you're going to go with it or no you don't take the trade now if you decide to go with it this is right before this is before you hit that click okay we're still over here time wise okay you make a plan okay i'm going to get in at this price. I'm going to take partial profits at this price. I'm going to set my stop at this price. Okay. Stop is based on the volatility of the stock. I forget how far out it is. We'll see the spreadsheet in a minute. Probably about four points, three or four points at least on this one. 
Profit target, same thing. By the way, I just uploaded uh, one of two. I'm going to go ahead and probably upload both of them. It's going to save me a lot of time because I uploaded a couple of, um, or I'm uploading two videos on R versus R, risk versus reward, because I get a lot of questions on that, especially you system-oriented people. System-oriented people and people who began, who just began to read books about trading where they say, you should take profits at three times your initial risk, okay? I say take partial profits at one time, one time your initial risk, and they all gasp. <gasps> you can't do that. But, and here's the big but, you follow that trend and stay with that trend as long as it trends. And hopefully on that second part of your trade, that second loaf, you take profits at 10 times or 50 times or 100 times. Slight exaggeration, but it could happen, your initial risk. And that's good stuff. And that's where the real good stuff is. Okay. Anyway, I'm, I'm uploading those videos as an FYI. I've got one uploaded to YouTube already. Uh, it's from last year's Week in Charts. You can uh, watch those or just uh, get the flash drive for last year or get the flash drive for this year, too, while you're at it. Anyway, once you have a plan, all you have to do is follow the plan. That's all you have to do. And look, right here, see the little happy guy? You're nice and relaxed. There's no stress on you because you're drinking that cup of coffee after the close like I like to do, and you're looking at some charts, and you're trying. You're on a little treasure hunt trying to find the next big winner. And that's how you roll. That's what you do. So you need to be relaxed in this phase. And if you have a little experience, you will be. And the best setups will tend to jump out at you. Okay? So once you know all this, make that plan before you get in. And then all you have to do is follow that plan. Okay? Now, you guys who are disciplined and do that are like, why is he beating a dead horse on this? Well, because... I get emails all the time from people. Dave, this stock has gone 50 points against me. What should I do? What you should have done was you should have had a plan before you bought that stock. When you're in this relaxing phase, okay? It's kind of like uh, Tyson says, kind of everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face, right? Well, make sure you make that plan before you get punched in the face by the market. And follow that plan. What should I do? Well, has the stop been hit yet? No, it has not. Then you should do absolutely nothing. Okay? So, again, you move from the known to the unknown. And markets can be stressful. I mean, I'm I'm and I don't know why I'm I have such a bad mouth today, but I'm I'm pissed off. It's not working. Okay? I want every stock to work. Okay? I still have emotions. Just because I decided to trade, that'd be a no longer have a pulse. I'm kind of aggravated, okay? But I'm not going to get out of it because I have a plan. So make that plan, plan that trade, and trade that plan, okay? Now, while you're in the planning phase, okay, here's something to remember. You want to avoid too many moving parts, okay? I was talking with someone a while back, back when our TC chat group was a little more active. Anybody in here remember the TC chat group? It used to be fun, but it I, I got busy for a couple of weeks, and these chat groups, it's amazing. It's like you, you're you there every day, and, and there's a whole bunch of people there, and, and then if you take a break, all of a sudden, they die out almost overnight. It's very hard to keep that up and running, but we had a little chat group, and it was fun. It still exists. It's in TC. If you um, private message me through TC sometimes, maybe I'll hop in and comment on some things if you want me to. But uh, anyway, but somebody was in there, and they were talking about their, they were selling calls and um, on stocks that they bought. And I was like, okay, that's fine, but it's kind of limited your gains, and what do you do? Well, you roll them up, you sell another. Well, what if it goes down? Well, it's like, do you sell a stock? Well, you can buy a put. Then you could, it's like, it's like, wow, man, it, it got complicated really, really fast. And then one of the engineers in the group who does do a few more complicated things, but he pointed out that 
yeah, it started to get too many moving parts, and that kind of stuck with me from that point forward. So if you are going to trade a stock, just keep it as simple as possible. For me, it's a stop, S-T-O-P. If this stock hits the stop, I am stopped out. i got to get out, okay? There's a little discretion I might apply here and there, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. But for the most part, if I'm stopped, I'm stopped. What is, is, okay? So avoid too many moving parts. Don't say that if I get into this semiconductor as a short and the SMH makes new highs, then I'm going to exit it. Well, I mean, how are you going to, are you going to, now you got to follow the SMH too, and then now you've got to figure out, okay, well, it may do highs, let me exit it, wait a minute, it's going the right direction, should I, should I really exit it? And then, wait a minute, if I look over this Morningstar Industry Group, it stalled well short of its old high. So, is the SMH a true proxy for the semiconductors? And I don't know, I don't have the answer to that, but I, I tend to use the Morningstar Group for that, okay? So it can get complicated really fast, especially if your sell signals are derived, meaning that you're going to sell one market if some other market does something else. And that's, I'm kind of getting a little ahead of myself here, but sometimes that could work really well, but it could be a forest for the trees thing. Uh, TC chat room is is it for gold or also it's I'm just using I'm using platinum and I'm using the older version and it's in the um, it's in the older version I, I think it, I'm guessing it's in a new version too I don't know if one I don't know what happened somebody will know um right now I kind of hinted to this earlier you need to see the forest for the trees and. By that, it seems like there's some, it's, and again, a whole new crop of people come up every so often. It depends on what the market is doing. And right now, it's like people think that you could just play this momentum game or maybe just sell puts or something, okay, because the market is going up. Well, the market doesn't only go up. And that's what you have to realize. Um, somebody recently was in my trading service they liked the service but they didn't renew and I asked them why and they were just they just been in for a couple of months they said well over the last couple of months I've been working on my own trading system and it's been working really well so that's what I'm gonna do well maybe they discover something okay but I've been at this for about publicly about 20 years privately even more because I didn't you know, I had to knew, I had to know something before I became a public figure. Uh, so I've been at it for a long time, but it's probably taken me 15, 20 years to really get my head wrapped around my methodology, to peel those indicators off, to not look at the SMH when I'm trading, once I'm trading, or so once I'm in a semiconductor stock and all these other things. And so somewhere between 10 and 20 years to figure all this out, and maybe they did find, figure out something over a couple of months. I don't know. And maybe it will work 20 years from now. Okay? But the point is, just make sure you see the forests for the trees if you're working on something and you looked at it for a couple of months. Make sure you go back and look at the last, well, 100 years in the indices, but last at least 20 years or so in the actual markets. Go back and study some of these really bad markets like way back in the 70s I wasn't actually trading back then I didn't come into the 80s but way back in the 70s uh, things chopped around a lot and you you could have gotten um, hurt really bad with, with a lot of these different things or you just would have had to have been really patient so see the forest for the trees or risk chafe nipples now this is I've told this story before um, when I was a kid, I was water skiing with a, with a buddy of mine, and, um, you know, I climbed back in the boat, or he climbed back in the boat, I forget which was which, and um, we were headed somewhere, I forget, and um, and I grabbed the wheel, and I start turning the wheel, or whatever, and I start driving over, instead of driving down the, uh, the, the, the bayou, 
which was a big bayou. It's a false river we were in. I start motoring over to these kids, okay? He's like, what are you doing? I was like, well, the kids were playing on these, um, if you've ever been around oil field stuff, they have these huge pipelines, and they float them out with these huge pieces of styrofoam, maybe 10 feet in diameter. They're just absolutely huge. And there were a bunch of little kids playing on this piece of styrofoam that had broken off from one of these pipelines. It was just kind of floating down the bayou. And they were having a blast, and they were sliding up and down this thing, just absolutely laughing and giggling and having the best time of their life. And a friend of mine who was a little bit older than me, he grabs the wheel and pulls it back the other way. And he goes, he says, what are you doing? Well, first of all, I said he wanted to know what I was doing. So I'll, let me tell you, one, one, cup of, one, one Mountain Dew next week, Dave. So I, he says, what are you doing? I said, well, you know, when I was younger, I used to go to the beach, and I'd play on these styrofoam surfboards. You know, we'd buy a new one every time we go there. Uh, but you got to be careful because if you play on them all day long, that styrofoam doesn't seem like it's abrasive, but it is. It will really chafe your skin, and especially like your stomach area where it's a little bit soft, especially on me, I guess, now. And it really chafes your nipples because that's what's rubbing up and down that styrofoam all day. And to a point where you can't sleep at night, you can't. it's, it's almost impossible to shirt on. I, I had to tell you, it's the most painful thing in the world. So I started motoring over to these kids, and this story does have an ending, I, I promise. Long story endless. And he reaches over, grabs a wheel, turns it the other way. So we start going away from him. I'm like, what are you doing? And this guy was a couple years older than me. He goes, Dave, experience is the best teacher. So I'm sure those kids went home, and I'd be willing to bet a million bucks that that's probably the last time they played on a big piece of oil field styrofoam that was adrift. So you need to see the forest for the trees. If you are developing a new methodology or putting a tweak on an old one or whatever the case may be, just make sure that what you're doing isn't within a certain sweet spot of the market to where that thing is working really well. I had a, I've seen it many, many, many times. I'll see people come to me who have phenomenal years, and they present this to me, and they have phenomenal years, and I'm like, okay, that's fine, but I noticed you made your money selling options, so let's see if you can do that again next year. Well, it was a choppy market that whole year, and I tell them, come back to me at the end of next year, and so far, no, no, no one has. I'm not saying that someone can't develop something, but when someone has an extraordinary year like that, and they're just starting out, okay, two big ands, okay, or a big and, chances are they may have just hit a sweet spot in something. So see the forest for the trees. I'm beginning to see that right now. Uh, a lot of people in this bare bull leg, I hope that went a Freudian slip, this bull leg we've been in forever, have given up. Or on the short side, well, actually, they haven't given up. They probably never have shorted before. They just turned it to buy and hold type of players. And they've been buying and holding for a long, long time, since maybe 2009, 2010, or whatever. So what email me yesterday? Oh, since 2011, market's just going up. Why am I bearish? Well, I'm not bearish. I'm just cautious. Okay, so never forget to see the forest for the trees. That Greg Morris interview was really good with uh, Covell a couple days ago that I posted on my website. Uh, it might have been just yesterday. So go in and look at yesterday's column. You can get the, the archives of my website. Watch that inter or listen to that interview. Uh, these are a lot of things that, that came out of that interview. Uh, and, you know, Greg's been around a lot longer than I have. So it's good, it's good to hear him from, from an old timer like that. So check that out. Okay, anyway, so make sure you see the forest for the trees. I think I've beat that dead horse. Do the right thing. This is left over from last week. It may be the week before. It can be hard, but it's a thing to do. If you have a sell signal in the market, then you need to take it, okay, or at least put on a couple of shorts when that occurs, and you need to let your stop stop you out. Well, the market might just go straight back up like it has for the last four or five years or whatever. 
but you know it's doing the right thing. And over the long run, doing the right thing is the hard thing to do. It is never different this time. If someone tells you it's different this time, you need to laugh in their general direction, okay? I bet, I'd be willing to bet that in 1929, somebody said, it's different this time. And then um, the Dow, I think, lost 90% of its value. And one of the biggest things is, you don't have to be right all the time, but be right over time. And that's a that's a line I stole from Greg also. That's in his book. All right. Getting a lot of feedback. Dave, shut up. Enough with the nipples. <laughs> no, that's not in here. Let's see. Okay, let's see. Just real quick. Let me clean this out. Uh, TC chat room is uh, platinum only, I believe. So, Bill, you you are correct. It is platinum only. Yeah, John says nobody knows where the future market is going. I could probably make a lot more money if I acted like I do more about the future, and instead tell instead of telling people honor your stops, do this, do this, wait for entries, all this money management, blah blah blah. I'd probably make a lot more money if I just say follow me. I know what's going to happen. And John says, if they did, though, you, you, you bet the ranch on every trade. It's a probability game. Yeah, money management. Absolutely. Agree 100% with you. Okay. Hey, Dave, tax day, April 15th was the last time MU SMA closed lower than the day before. Granted, for a trade, it did not work in a few days, but closing above the 20 day would work and have ended short for me on 818, the points of play. PLA and stops. Howard likes to use moving averages, so he's just pointing out um, how things work with his moving average system. That's fine. If you have a system, then use it. Okay. Two input and exactly what I did. Okay, I lost. <laughs> Any other good stories about growing up in the bayou? Ah. I'm sure I have a few. It's, uh, we should get together for a beer. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Okay, let's uh, let's get the dead money report out this week. Uh, brought to you by TrendFollowingMoron.com. And obviously, dead money is a slang term saying money that's not going to do you any good because it, it, there's no hope of it appreciating. Problem is, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen from now and then, and we don't know. Okay if that is going to work or not. But what do you do? What do we do? What do you have to do once you get in a position? Nothing. Honor your stop. That's all you have to do. Okay? Trading is not easy. But it's not nearly as difficult as most try to make it. Okay? And here's one that triggered here. It actually triggered back here. And we talked a little bit about discretion. We had a stop right around here. I stayed, I personally stayed with this one because it just kind of caved out and nicked the stop and it started meandering around it. Now, if it comes way down here, obviously, then you're stupid, okay? You got to get out. But if it just kind of nicks the stop, no problem. But then I went back in and said, okay, guys, I still think it's worth a shot. Uh, it's a, I'm a little bit more lenient to the IPO just because it looked good. It had a pretty good run up here. It sort of pulls back, right? So the re trigger was here. And what happened? It looked like it was going to do great, and then it just died. Died, 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 died. What happens? Everybody bails out. Okay? And then what happens? Of course, it takes off. So it took 57 days to go 60%. That's a percent a day, right? Annualized, that's 265%. So it's worth following your plan. If you just get a couple of these in the portfolio, it's worth following your plan. And the beauty of the reason it's annualized is because you're going to stay with this as long as it works, okay? Now, there will be some dead time in between. This one kind of ran up, came in, dead time, dead time, dead time. And then it finally started taking off and making new highs. So it's at 17.95 or 59%, 44 days. 
that's a hundred percent annual loss. So stick with them. Okay. My favorite example is one that triggered and went sideways for two months. Straight sideways. It was a beautiful setup. Went straight sideways for two months. I got an email off the email. Dave, it's dead money. Why are you still in it? Dave, it's dead money. Hello, Dave, you there? It's dead money. And then what happened? Got bought out 100% overnight. Okay? So just plan the trade and trade the plan. That's all you have to do. But here's the deal. I guess the day you start doing that, then I no longer get to do a weekly show. <laughs> and that would be a bummer. I don't know what I'd do on my Thursdays. Uh, here's that Micron in the portfolio. But, yeah, in case you were wondering, here's the uh, portfolio. And this is the Zen 1665. I think there was an earlier entry on that, too. Um, I don't know where it was, but it was lower than that. Anyway, 60%, better than the poke in the eye, at least so far. Uh, you could see how one big winner makes a big difference in the portfolio. That's nearly half of the entire portfolio in that one stock, okay? More than half if you count the first loaf. So the importance of, I cannot stress enough the importance of outliers. By the way, if you're going to build a system, I know a lot of little people, not little people, some are kind of large, that build systems that make a little, make a little, make a little, and then they have to get whacked. I would rather have a system that makes some, makes a little bit, and then occasionally, bam, makes a lot. Okay, so always position yourself to where you can could have an occasional big winner. Okay. A lot of trading firms are doing quantitative trading nowadays. That's the big buzz. That's the big deal. Okay. Guess what? That is fantastic. I like that because it's going to make the discretionary trader much more profitable. John goes on to say, did you do any analysis or research on this? Yes. I have a degree in computer science. I used to wake up super early. I still wake up super early, but those first two hours of the day, back then, I programmed. And I also programmed all. I programmed my, for myself first two hours of the day, trading systems. And then I had some consulting that I would do where I'd program trading systems for others. And if their systems weren't, weren't working, I would research them further, and I would help them tweak them to make them work. So I spent a lot of time programming mechanical systems and developing, and that made me a discretionary trader. So, yeah, I've been there, done that. Um, no, I'm not interested in, you know, I'm not interested in anything quantitative. I just showed you a pattern where I require uh, around 10 days, okay? Gap has to happen within 10 days. It will gap happen on day 11. Well, if you're quantitative, you don't take it, okay? But that might turn into the mother of all winners, okay? So, yeah, just not a big fan of uh, mechanical trading. Uh, men who could be both right and sit tight are uncommon. This is a little warm. I was looking for a quote from a column the other day. I couldn't find it, and I did stumble across that one. There's so much good information in uh, the book, Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. It's on my website, so check it out by Livermore. It's actually under a pen name, Lefevre, or however you say it. It's kind of like Brett Favre, uh, L-E-F-E-V-R-E. -E. But anyway, if you haven't read it, you need to. Read it once a year at least. So... When you get right on these positions like this and that, just sit tight and let it go, okay? Like the Frozen song, let it go and let it go. That's all you need to do. All right, lately we've been talking about this. Why is it starting to be so popular with firms nowadays since it's already used in the past? Well, they're using, they're using a lot of uh, complex algorithms, and they think that, those complex algorithms are going to um, be profitable or whatever, or they think because of the complexity, because it's difficult to figure out, it's uh, it's because it's so complex, um, it, it's going to work, okay? And I just got through saying avoid too many moving parts. Then a lot of that stuff is flash trading, and I think that's going to be a flash in the pan. Um, eventually, I think what's going to happen is they'll probably put some rules in place. I mean, it's borderline manipulation, and I think it is manipulation in some ways. 
I'm a big fan of free markets, but I think that if you're going to have a bid on something, you should honor that bid for one second. And I was talking to one of my colleagues last, uh, well, two, two or three times ago, I forget when. Whenever the one of my colleagues from from the UK, when I was in uh, uh, when I was wasn't in the UK, I haven't been in London yet. But um, when I was in Italy, talking to him, and he knows a little bit more about these kind of things than I do. And he was telling me about the location. They actually they buy up real estate right next to the exchange, so they get the quote uh, electronically quicker than others. And then I later found out recently, within a few months ago, there's a firm that moved their entire operation from one side of the building to the other side of the building to gain a microsecond or whatever. Um, and that's BS. So, and then recently, I think there was a firm that was going to go public, had 2,000 trading days or whatever without a loss. So that, that kind of reeks of, uh, in fact, the SEC is eliminating them. Anyway, Long is uh, investigating. I hope they eliminate them. Long story endless... Um, I was talking with this colleague, Rakesh, and, um, Rakesh, and, and he said um, that one second, that one second honoring would wipe out like 99% of all of that flash trading and all. So I'm a big fan of free markets, but I don't think that's free markets. I think that's more manipulation than anything. So, John, that's why it's so popular. Let me tell you something, John. Something is always popular. Uh, a few years back, the spread trading was really um, popular, it, and you guys probably didn't see it at a retail level, but I saw a lot of things happen on the institutional level where you'd buy one market and immediately sell another. Uh, two years before that, pairs trading was a big deal. There's always, it's, there's always going to be a big deal, okay? Stuff is going to come and stuff is going to go. In the end, the trend wins. Write that down. Sound like a... Uh, who always rhymes everything? Uh, Reverend Jackson Jackson. In the end, the trend's gonna win. <laughs> It'll be your friend, and then you make up you make up a word if you lose in an argument. Anyway, um, I was splitting up uh, a, an introductory thing. Uh, it, oh, by the way, that spread trading. I'm not talking about spread betting. I'm talking about spread trading. The market got really choppy for a while, like for a year. I forget which year it was. 2005. I'm trying to remember when. And all that stuff blew up, okay? So it works It works great for a while, and then it blows up. The flash trading is a whole, it's a whole other animal, okay? All right, anyway, Don's already wanting to know about Ford. Go away. <laughs> I'm half kidding. Okay, uh, I was parsing up an uh, introductory video of the trading, and I started putting intros to the, the different pieces and then um, follow-ups at the end and then introducing the next piece. And I'm not sure exactly why, but it, it made me realize in two things. One, the, I think the pieces of the video are, are better than the whole because you're getting things in small doses. But it made me realize for whatever reason how important psychology, money management, and the methodology are, but not in and of themselves, but together it kind of reminds me or, or it's it's and I've talked about this before being like a three-legged stool but more importantly I think it's more of like a rope with three strands and what the epiphany I had is let's say your money management gets a little bit better well then instead of micromanaging yourself out of the next big trade what's going to happen you're going to stick with that next big trade and now all of a sudden you feel better about the methodology and then this is going to come down here, and you can be more likely to take the next viable setup, rinse, and repeat, okay? And this is one thing I said. Let's say you do ride out a big winner, okay? You didn't micromanage yourself out of those two I just showed earlier, okay? And they turn into huge big winners. Well, when you do that, in the future, you're going to be more likely to stick with the plan and follow the plan. So now you've gotten that down, okay? And you're going to recognize what the next big winner is going to look like. Are you going to get better at your stock picking? So now you've improved, not only improved your money management, your position management, 
your psychology has improved, and now you're better at identifying big winners. And then guess what? You get to ride out another winner, rinse and repeat, and each one of these becomes stronger and stronger. Now, one of the things about the methodology, the more you know about the methodology, the better off you're going to be. And it, it, it aggravates me on the retail side of the business because what happens is when I'm doing great, everyone piles in. And when things get a little choppy, everybody leaves. And they leave right at the time that things start doing fantastic again. And that makes me, that just drives me crazy. And some of you might say, well, that's probably a short trip for you, Dave. Well, maybe it is. But it drives me absolutely crazy. So if you know the nuances of the methodology, and I don't care what methodology it is. I talked about people think they're a genius because they sell options. That's the that's a best way to have a very brilliant but brief career on Wall Street. Don't believe me? Do it. Okay? But they'll sell options for like a year. And, uh, Dave, I made 340% next last year. Well, good for you, okay? Again, come see me next year at this time. Let's see how you did. Not one of those persons has come back, okay? So you need to know the nuances of the methodology. So if you know you can occasionally blow up, then maybe you could figure out a way to circumvent that. But with my stuff... One of the nuances that you really need to wrap your head around is that when the market begins to change trend, you're going to underperform for a while. But if that trend ensues, the new trend develops, that emerging trend becomes a trend transition, then you're going to do just fine. And this was a webinar I was given a couple days ago. And this is, uh, this is up on YouTube. This is a part of a YouTube video. And... This is a trading. This is the equity curve of my trading service using some discretion, okay? And this is the actual market down here. This is the S&P. So obviously, you could guess this is what 2008, okay? So I need to figure out a better way to label this. But look what happened. It's like the market is kind of working its way higher. So what happens? The equity gets better and better and better. Even even begins to accelerate higher. Okay. Well, at this point where you're printing money, it's fantastic. You don't quit because you don't know if it's going to go up and up and up and up and up. But you do hit a bit of a drawdown. Well, guess what's happening in the overall market? It went flat, and then it began to roll over. Well, notice that if the market keeps rolling over, what happens is the equity curve eventually turns back up. Okay. Now, keep in mind, each one of these little ticks is a quarter, so you can go several quarters without making a lot of money, waiting for that market to trend again. But at some point, what happens is you stop taking positions. So you start going into a drawdown, and you take fewer and fewer positions, okay, and so you end up completely flat, and then what happens is like you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and then all of a sudden you start seeing some positions that look pretty good. You start taking them, and then your equity curve starts going up, market trends, okay. Now, look what happened 2009, Market turned around. What happened to the portfolio? Well, all of those shorts that you were making money off, there or any remaining shorts, got stopped out. So you lost money when that market had a sharp turnaround. But guess what? Hey, I recognized it. Bow ties galore. First thrust galore. What happens? Equity curve starts trending nicely higher. So that's the no you do on this. And I'm showing this, too, because someone was asking me to explain how the drawdowns work with the methodology. And uh, they were kind enough to think that, hey, I don't see how you can have drawdowns. Well, trust me, we do. And, again, I'm probably tippering everybody's expectations too much. But realize when that market does begin to turn, you're on the wrong side of the trend, okay? So you're long while the market's going up. You're long, still long while the market's beginning to go down. But then soon you get stopped out, okay, stopped out, stopped out, stopped out, stopped out. Then you start getting short, and you start making money again. Okay, so hopefully that made sense, and I'm hoping that I did a good job explaining that drawdown. So getting back to the intertwined nature. So let's say you do go through the drawdown, and you begin stopping out of some positions. Okay, now in this particular case, 
the market's actually rolling over, like I just showed, okay? So here are you getting stopped out, but you also see the market beginning to tank in here, okay? So what happens? You observe observe additional losses that could have been or were avoided. So you're in a stock and you're doing pretty good and then all of a sudden stops out, okay? We go like, dang, got stopped out. But then the stock does this and all of a sudden you're feeling a heck of a lot better. And then you begin to realize that he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. So now what happens? Well, you get stopped out, stopped out, stopped out. All of a sudden you're like, well, maybe I better become more selective in my stock picking. And then if the market's actually rolling over, or I need to see the other side of the market, in that case, start shorting. And then what happens? Well, eventually, you might end up flat for a while, but eventually you reach a point where you can't stand it. You see a position that looks pretty darn good, long or short, depending on the case of what the market's doing. You decide to take it, and guess what? That turns into a new winner. And then that new winner, getting back to the slide we just looked at, well, then you ride out a big winner. You better identify winners. You're more likely to stick to the plan, blah, blah, blah. And then you ride out another winner, rinse and repeat. Do you always follow your stop, or do you consider other factors where the stop is hit? If it's a stock, Nick, that's why I'm always showing, that's why, uh, not always showing, that's why I left that SPWR in the portfolio, because it just it just barely touched the stop, and I thought it'd be good to leave it in the portfolio, the mechanical portfolio, to show people how a little bit of discretion can make all the difference in the world. Thirty-two thousand dollars on a, of course, hypothetical. Okay, keep the let's keep it legal. Uh, account that's thirty-two percent round numbers, thirty-two and a half percent. Okay, so that's a pretty good return in about a year's time on just one stock. And then if you add in the other 1,000 you made on that one, the other 1K, then that's 33%. Okay, so that's a good return. So that's a stop nick. The stock, the stop. let's use this as an example, was at 9. It went down to 9. It never traded below 9. And it turned around right around 9. So, yeah, in that case, you can stick with it. I've done many, 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 many presentations on discretion. Also, if you read the second half of the layman's guide, to trading stocks, you will see that that um, 34 to 38 monthly drawing a chart, the market appear to be trending up fairly consistently. Let's see, 34 to 38, 34 to 38, let's see, 34, well, it was kind of going down there, and it's choppy. Okay, it was pretty choppy there, and then it's sort of going up. Well, sometimes there's some lag. Yeah, I don't know what happened here, but sometimes there's some lag. And then uh, probably, you know, probably what happened was one of those rollovers in the market. It was a rollover here that didn't pan out. So these were probably some shorts that didn't work. But then notice how it came flying out of the drawdown right here. It came flying out. Okay. Now this does. This is discretion and compounding. So some the compounding may have had an effect on that too. Quarterly compounding. Okay. Plus discretion. But, yeah, I'll go in and look and figure out what happened there because I do know that that's one of those cases, again, where the market rolled over. And look, look where the market is here, and look where the market is here. So that's a, that's a long, choppy period of time or a long time without a whole lot of forward progress. And somehow it, it actually outperformed here. So I guess sometimes it can outperform uh, even when the market is um, going sideways. But, yeah, and that's where those few outliers makes a big difference, okay? Um, I haven't officially scheduled it yet. Quick, a couple of quick announcements, and we'll get the rest of those questions and everything else. Uh, second IPO webinar, follow-up webinar for the IPO course will be uh, next Friday. Not tomorrow, but next Friday at 11 EDT. And to those of you who got the course or have the course, uh, it, these announcements and links are on the course page behind the firewall. Okay. Um, all this stuff can be found, obviously, at my store. And um, 
2014 Volume 1 is available. If you like these shows and you like learning about chafe nipples and stuff, um, then you'll love these disk drives. And this is, I started just writing down everything we covered this year, and it was just amazing me. What happened, I had to enlarge my screen. I had so many things to put on here. But anyway, it's pretty cool. Uh, most uh, you get like pretty good bang for your buck with those, if I say so myself. Uh, I'm still running the special. I, I I know I'm probably supposed to put an end to it, and um, I, I'll probably I probably will within a, a few weeks. But uh, right now, at least for the time being, if you get the stock selection webinar, I'm throwing in one year to the trading service plus the IPO webinar. So if you add all that up, it comes to like three thousand, four thousand dollars worth of stuff, and uh, for one. For about a third of that. Uh, anyway, uh, we still have three sessions left. I got four here, so it's three sessions, sessions, three live sessions left. So if you do sign up for the for the IPO course, you have uh, three webinars left on that. Anyway, that's enough of that. And let's go ahead and hop into the charts. Um, if you want to start asking about individual stocks, that's fine. Bloomberg News, Speed Traders sees NYSE as floor takes Goldman post. Okay. Uh, send me that link and I'll put it up on my website if you want yeah, about the about that. Okay. We'll get to that. Yeah, they could there's some aberrations, you know, Tom. Tom was asking about that drawdown. Sometimes there's some aberrations with the methodology where um, it'll just beat the pants off the market, and then sometimes there's times where it, it doesn't it doesn't do that well in spite of the market. And, it's, and, and during that time, sometimes you might have you might have a big cap rally, and it's just the big cap, and it's that's not the stocks we're trading. There was one time I'm trying to think exactly when it was. Maybe when was it? Uh, last year or whenever, when the only thing in the world that was rallying was defensive stocks, stocks that we would never buy, uh, HV of 17, 18, excuse me, I'm out just kicking me in the butt, uh, HV. So the market really wasn't conducive to the momentum trader. And sometimes the market just goes away from momentum for a while, goes away from momentum and goes over to, I hate to say value, but these defensive stocks, like just, Consumer non durables, REITs, just this boring stuff that's really low in volatility. And the market can make new highs on those stocks. Okay, you could have very narrow leadership for a long time. And when that happens, most stocks are going down, but the narrow leadership is keeping up the P's or whatever. Um, and you, you'll underperform when that occurs. It's just an aberration. And that's where living through these cycles and being around for a long time can really help you out. There's no substitute for experience. Experience is what you get right after you needed it the most. And that's true. So you might you might end up with some uh, you might end up a little chafed at times. That's one thing I can guarantee. Alright, I'm not gonna beat the dead horse too much on the market. Let me just go over a couple things really with you really quick and then we'll hop out into your individual stocks. Um, market's been banging out new highs as of late last two days notwithstanding my big concern was or remains that it's this V-shaped recovery at a high level, okay? I don't mind a V-shaped recovery at a low level like um, 2009, for instance. Let's see if we can get it maybe on a weekly chart. Um, you know, a V-shaped recovery at a low level is a completely different animal, okay? It's a V-shaped recovery at a high level, kind of like back here 2007 we had. That scares me a little bit, and that's what we're kind of going through now, but on a little bit more micro of a level, okay? The reason is, by the time the market gets all the way back to its prior highs, it's already a little bit overbought, and I guess some people are looking to take profits, okay? The other thing, too, if you're going to have a double top, it's not going to be textbook like that in nature. It's going to either stall well short of the prior highs like that, kind of gatekeeper-ish, or it's going to shoot past that prior high and then die if it, if it truly is going to die. Okay, so it's going to fake out first, and this is kind of like the all clear. Hey, water's fine, come on in. It's all clear, and that's where you got to be careful. Okay. Yeah. Amen. 
Howard says, what helps to make one successful is to still have capital left to trade after the inevitable drawdown comes. So once the market starts to trend again, you, you can still trade. Money management is big, big key. Believe it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, preach to the choir here, buddy. But, yeah, that's the point. It's like you got a portfolio of stocks that get stopped out. The market starts chopping around. You can't find a setup to save your life. You look at your portfolio and... 90% of it's still there. I mean, I can't always guarantee just 10% you'll lose, but at least the vast majority of it will be there. If you're risking only 2% per trade and you get stopped out of a half a dozen trades, and then all of a sudden things just kind of start chopping around, your drawdown has stopped and you're in cash. You're like, hey, I lived. And let's say you're a long only trader and you get into a market like 2009. And, I mean, some of my best friends are long-only traders. That's fine. I, I, I'm a trader. I like to see both sides of the market. I think shorts help you to become a better trader. You don't always make a lot of money on them. I mean, they're a pain in the butt. That's lectures that I've given many a times. But if you're a long-only trader and you practice sound money management and you are a trend follower, then what happens at a year like 2008? Well, you can stop that everything, and then you watch – you keep let's say you keep 90% of your capital and then you watch the market go down 50% and you watch the average mutual fund go down 50% the average fund manager go down 50% half that half will kill you especially if you're planning on retiring anytime soon right so yeah money management is key and being in cash as a long-only trader and watching that market go down, that's a pretty good lesson. Let's take a look at NASQAQ. So far, NASQAQ has uh, broken out past its prior low peak in here. So far, so good at 14-year highs. A little bit of a blip today, but uh, so far, actually coming back a little bit in here. So, so far, so good. So, indices looking okay. You could argue the overbought thing, and I can't disagree with you on that. The Russell 2000 continues to bring up the rear, or as we call him, Rusty. And it's down a little bit today. I wouldn't get too excited, though. Uh, one concern here was uh, a couple of weeks ago it just looked like a pullback. But as I've been saying, if he keeps pulling back, pulling back, pulling back, pulling back, pulling back, sooner or later it's no longer a correction or a pullback, and it becomes brand-new highs. But so far, it hasn't quite made us those new highs. That's something that I really like to see in the overall market. One thing that sort of... Um, I found interesting yesterday is a lot of areas, in spite of the market, overall market being flat, had decent rallies like the energies. I think the drillers had a big day. They didn't, I said they made new highs in the uh, market in a minute. They made like two-month highs, and they're just shy of these uh, multi-year highs. Uh, telecom had a really good day yesterday. As you can see, bam, went up really big. And it's good to see these, these variety of sectors wake up even on a flat day. So that's overall. Most sectors look like the market itself, and a lot of them have banged out new highs. Hardware, software, drugs have been doing really well. Okay, Biotech has come back nicely. Some of the sectors that have been rolling over, like retail, okay, look at that. Looked like they were just going to die. Gap down and everything. What have you done? They're going straight back up. Hey, Dave, you still short that rad. Why don't you exit it? Retail's going up. Well, I gotta stop. I don't care. All right, I get stopped out. I get stopped out. So be it. Here's the semis. A little bit of concern in the semis. Now forget about the SMH for a while. That's probably weighted in something. Notice the semis, kind of bigger picture wise, kind of have a gatekeeper look to them. And let's see, that's a weekly. But whatever you want to call, it, they've so far they stalled short of their prior highs in here. So that's got me a little bit concerned. But that's just one sector. Telecom's doing really good. Hardware's doing good. Software's doing good. Retail's breaking out new highs. So for the most part, things are doing pretty good. A couple of areas, not as well. And, you know, I hate to play. I don't want to try to play both sides against the middle, but it was kind of fun. I think it was yesterday or day before. I forget when. We had two longs go up and two shorts go down. Or I should say the stocks of the shorts went down. The value portfolio went up on those two. Not by a lot, but by a little. And then the longs went up. So 
it's okay to have shorts on if you when the, when you see them, and then if the market goes on to make new highs, then just ride them out. You might have an aberration. It might work in spite of the market. Okay. All right. Uh, I don't see any reason to go through these sectors. Just just know that most look like the market itself. And then again, I think if any, you should gleam anything. Of course, today notwithstanding, but even within some of these subsectors, uh, areas like money center banks have recently broken out. Of course, I didn't realize it was getting whacked this bad this morning, but as a general statement, something like telecom is a good, better example. But I've been seeing these little pockets of strength throughout, and that's always a good thing. All right, let's open it up for some stocks. Uh, Le Jou is going to be an IPO, and it looks good. That's a, What a way to start the show. Look at that. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Look at this nice little base in here, okay? And you can still argue it's still kind of a base here. here. You know, broke out, didn't really come back in. And then broke out and came right back down. That's beautiful. Absolutely. I've been watching this when it should be on my Landry 100. And hopefully it won't make a liar out of me. Landry 100. Le Jou? Yeah, right there. Yeah, so it's in my list. It's on my watch list. But, yeah, now it's set up, and now it looks good. So high five. That's the first high five of the day. In fact, if I saw it before you, I would not have put it on. I would not have showed, I would not have showed everybody else. Um, but it wasn't set up coming into today, but it is now. It looks great. Fantastic. Kite. Kite I don't like for some reason, and I forget why. Well, I got bad data, obviously. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I mean, it's just kind of gapped up in here. It's going to be hard to see with the bad data. I guess I didn't like it because it, it, it went higher and then it died out. Um, maybe if it could follow through on a pullback. It's trying to come back. M-O-B-L as a long M-O-B-L. Uh, I don't like the way it kind of came back in. It looks okay. Uh, maybe it needs to come back. You know, if you just look at that, this is where sometimes you need to be a little bit more lean with IPOs. If you just look at that, this, uh, and if it's going to have to pull back a little bit more, but it looks okay. But it needs a little bit more pullback. Enzn, Enzn, yeah, on a pullback. I mean, that's um, certainly going higher. Cheap stock. Ah, oh, oh nope, never mind. Too many bad memories, too much overhead resistance. I'd pass on that. True. I don't like true anymore. I was long this one forever. Um, wait a minute. I'm confusing true with tour. Uh, but I was long true, too. Yeah, true looks good. I, I like a tiny bit more pullback, but for the most part, yeah, it looks good. That's another good-looking stock. Um, is that in the Landry 100? Yes, it is right there. Bam, winning. <laughs> Rig P, R I G P. Um, yeah, I don't know what part of trans. I don't know if that's like the major Transocean or what the deal with this one is. But yeah, on a pullback, possibly. I mean, so well, it's only a couple points. So watch the scaling on here, but maybe on a pullback. But do watch the scaling on that just in case. C L V S long hit a bow tied up first correction at a twenty E M A. That 20 EMA stop is going to be a little tight there, Howard. Uh, just a warning, as we've said before. No, it's got. I don't like the overhead supply in here and all. I mean, I hear you, but uh, I don't like the overhead supply and bad memories. Just too many bad memories along the way. If this base here were about two years long, I would call out a Phoenix stock and I'd be all over it. Okay. Andy, strong uptrend. Those little, those little candy mints, candy mints. Uh, yeah, but you know, this thing just fell straight out of bed, and now it just kind of went straight up. Yeah, for a 29 HV stock, it sure is all over the place. Um, I would pass on that. Long I N U V, I N U V. No, nah, it's all over the place. Uh. Yeah, no, and you got too many bad memories back here. It's cheap stock. It is thin, especially given the cheapness of it. That's gonna be that's gonna be a wild ride. I mean, good luck with that. ACCO for Andre. 
ACCO. Ah, maybe on a pullback. Let's see what else is going on here. And it's kind of wide and loose longer term. But personalities can change. I mean, I think mine's changed a few times during this presentation. Maybe on a pullback. A little wide and loose, though. ACCO. Did we just throw Rambus or MBS? That one could be crazy. Something I don't like about that one. What are you doing? Going long or short? I, I do neither. Um, it's just kind of going sideways in here now. I mean, if anything, it looks like you can make a new leg down, but it's not a setup. Ah, I don't like GDXJ anymore. If it's still in this list, it needs to come out. I haven't updated my list in a few days. GDXJ, if I can get it to come up. Yeah, see, it's see, it's still in here, but I haven't updated my list. I took out that one, and what took its place? Celgene took its place. Okay, so that's a good that's a good lesson on how momentum works. Okay. Now, keep in mind, I'm trading this, or I'm not even trading this. This is uh, this is just my momentum list. So you can see this lost momentum, right? Well, it's going sideways for a few weeks. If you're long and you're not stopped out, stay long. That's two different things, okay? That's two completely different things. If you're managing a momentum list, then the momentum has to be there. Different set of rules. So I'm getting rid of GDXJ. It should have, it, it should have came out a few days ago. And what's going in? Celgene. Notice the difference between Celgene, okay? That's an arrow for August and GDXJ. That's an arrow for August, okay? So loss of momentum, it got bumped out. Celgene bumped it out. Did that make sense? Origin is short. Yeah, I could break down, but it's not set up. Rex, King of Carnival, kind of thin, only 160,000, but as a private trader, you could trade it. It's 100 bucks a share, so not too bad. Uh, bad as far as being thin. I mean, it's still dollar-wise pretty big, pretty big cap. Uh, maybe on a pullback. I don't know. It's already going up 500%. Does it have another 500% in it? I don't know. I'd, I'd like to find something else like that Zen, which might still have 500% left in it. RL for holidays? RL, what does that mean? Uh... Love the clothes, hate the stock. Um, you got a little weird supply here. It's kind of wide and loose longer term. I'd leave it alone. Uh, I mean, I hear you, Susan. Uh, it, it looks pretty good, just shorter term. But longer term, it's got some issues. I think I'd stay away from it. They're not splitting the atom either. ATHM. At home. ATHM. Oh yeah, you got. Let's see, y'all did this to me last week. I left this list up here, and y'all started going down the list. Are y'all doing that again? I'm gonna hide it. I'm gonna hide it to where just a pointer will tell me whether it's in the list or not. Yeah, it looks good. Um, you know, I don't like the prior peak in here, and that it's just getting past the prior peak. But that was a while back. It is still relatively new issue. What I call a toddler. We talked about the toddlers in the um, IPO webinar. So, or of course. So, yeah, uh, maybe it's just a tiny bit more pullback, but not too much, okay? That's kind of on the cusp of being almost good enough. Has Rick pulled back or consolidated enough? Rick's going to be a gold stock. And Rick is in my list. See it down here? Bam, okay? Because it's a momentum stock, and that's why it's in there. Now, see, now, if you're not already long Rick, you need to wait for it to break out again and then play the next pullback on that one, okay? Two, future entry. Okay, let's take a look at it. T-U-B-E. Sorry if I already covered it. No, I did not. Um, well, tube is actually is actually triggered because it's making all-time highs. There's a little bit more to the methodology than that, but for the most part, that's it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you want to be pretty brave, I mean, that was a pretty big jump, like 50% overnight. That's too much. It's a little too dangerous now to go in and trade it because it's jumped 50% overnight. But technically, you would be long that because it did make new um, new highs. I don't think I would. I don't think I'd take it as a new trade. It's too dangerous now. CMCM. 
Cheatham. Notice that Cheatham is in my Landry list. My friend Rob Hanna, and he does a little mechanical work, uh, but he also has discretion on top of it. Um, his wife's name, his name is Rob, and his wife's name is Cheatham. So it's uh, Robin Cheatham. <laughs> He's a nice guy. He's in the AAPTA with me. Um, it's Cheetah. I got gotcha. you. It's not set up anymore. So, again, you've got a case now where, yeah, it's trending higher, but it would have to break out the new highs and then pull back again. But if you pay attention to the IPO webinar, I'm just saying your buy would have been right there. Would have been pretty good. MS or XLF financials. MS? What is MS? Okay. Yeah, financials have been doing pretty good as of late. Um, I wouldn't rush out and trade Morgan Stanley because it's not that big of a breakout, and it's also a really thick, thick, thick stock. HV is pretty low, 19. Um, I think some of those wild and crazy stocks we looked at earlier would probably make better candidates for um, a momentum type of trade. XLF is uh, the financials. Uh, yeah, the financials broke out. I wish they had broke out. I wish they would have broken out a little bit more. But they are coming back today. So, so far, so good in the financials. LinkedIn? I hadn't looked at that in a long time. LNKD. Uh, well, it's making new highs, or marginal new highs. Um, yeah, it hadn't been on my radar because it's just not really making great new highs. It does have some overhead supply in it, so I would I would not go long the stock unless it made new highs decisively and then all time highs and then look to play pullbacks. Okay, Bitta, Bitta's on my list. If not, it will be. Yeah, it's on the list. See right there. Okay. Uh, yeah, and a little bit more pullback. Absolutely. My only concern with something like Bitta is it's already up. Thousand percent, two thousand. If you go further back in time, so this is where people could ask me, "What do you mean price for perfection?" I'm just wondering if it's price for perfection, meaning that it's um, it's it has ran its course. MOBL. Did we look at that one yet? Oh, look at that! It's on the Landry list. Bam, right there, winning. Uh, yeah, we looked at that one already. Okay. Is there resistance between six five and nine for the stocks? Some are cause for concern. Well, uh, trust your gut there, John. If if it's bothering you, then it's cause for concern. Okay, between six point five and nine. I don't see. Well, that was a long time ago, but I do hear you. I mean, sometimes markets do have long memories. And in general, though, this stock tends to chop around a lot, so I would be careful uh, with it. Okay. Netflix, not one of my favorites. Oops. Um, you see how it really didn't get past its prior little peak in here? I'm not really crazy about that. Uh, it is coming off of all-time highs, though, so it would have to really break out to new highs decisively and then maybe on a pullback. I think it's you could probably find something that's going to be a little bit less efficient than Netflix. Kang? Kang. Uh, no, I mean, if you're long, stay long. Um, your buy point would have been right here. If you're long, stay long. But it broke above this range, and then it just kind of came back in. Um, it might turn into what I call a Darvis stock, where you box on top of boxes. That's what I'm kind of, I hate to use the word hope. Did he, uh, hope it for JD. JD. And I made a nice little box in here. And now it's going to go on and make another little box on top. NEM long for Mr. Doc or Dr. Doc. NEM, I guess that's redundant. Um, these gold stocks are kind of wide and loose and choppy. Um, I saw one yesterday. Let's see. I've got some in my Landry list here that might be a little bit better than NEM. Uh, I hear you, though. It's kind of bottomed out longer term. 
does have a lot of bad memories along the way, but that's gold and that's possible. Uh, I I think I would pass because now it's it's pulled back too many days at the pullback, and now it's crawling back to its old highs. Wait for it, uh, Doc, to break out decisively, and then and then maybe play pullbacks along the way. But there were some uh, gold stocks. What did we just look at, Rick? Uh, maybe Rick, if it continues to break out in here, uh, some of these uh, lower tier stocks that are just beginning to um, to get going might might have a better potential than one of those older well-established gold companies. Gold's been kind of, um, gold could be a little frustrating to trade, and it's like we did well, we made a little money in it early in the year, then we got stopped out second time around. I think we, I don't know if we hit the initial profit target or not, I don't remember, but gold could be really tough and choppy in a very efficient market to trade. Fold, yeah, Fold's on fire. Fold actually went into the Landry list yesterday. It's not in, It's not reflected here, but yeah, I hear you. Um, and how's my little baby doing? Yeah, seven percent. So seven percent in one day is not bad. Um, I can't trade like this. I can't buy a stock making new highs on expansion of range. But that's exactly the rule I use to manage my Landry 100, and it's fun. I have a I, you know I'm such a nerd, but I have a blast doing this. And uh, you know when I come in today and see it up seven percent, knowing that it went in last night, I just don't have it here yet at the close. Um, I'm pretty excited. PBR, another one went in. What else? UTX, I could use a PBR. Not till after six, I guess. UTX. Uh, it looks like it's in trouble as a possible short, but too many days in the pullback. I hear you though. I mean, it looks like it looks like it's in a lot of trouble. It's only got an HV of 13 though. Eh, you're gonna have to sit around in this one short forever to make any money on it. But I hear you. It looks like it's in trouble. Many years ago, Nifty Fifty buy and forget. Yeah, this is the Landry 100, but keep in mind, this thing is very dynamic. Let me see yesterday. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I had eight stocks go in, so eight of these stocks are coming out, or should have come out last night. I just haven't done the math yet. So that's 8%. That's an 8% turnover overnight. Not every night. Some nights I don't do anything as long as it's co -op, they cooperate. But, yeah, there is quite a bit of turnover in this list. Um, somebody was showing me a momentum list. They turn over every three months. I'm like, shoot, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of bad could happen in three months. I mean, even in this stock, it, they lost a substantial amount of money in a month. S-C-O-K. S-C-O-K. Uh, that's a that's a coal stock that's going straight up in here. It's just a little too. It's actually too, almost too wild and crazy for me. Um, maybe on a pullback. I, I hear you. It does have a phoenix look to it. Uh, at this juncture, I'd almost rather it break out again the new highs and then the next pullback on that one. HMLP. HMLP. H HMLP. Um. Well, what do, they, what do they do? Is it is it liquid natural gas? It's a gas company. I mean, from here to here, that's only three points. In this IPO world, I mean, things could be, like, take a look at tour. I mean, things could be a lot, a lot more crazier than that. I mean, you know, from, you know, bam, it's like 80% over a short period of time. So three points on a, in a as a trend trade is not really that much. F cell and then fuel. F C E O, fuel withered, blistered. What was their uh, album? Withered, blistered, burned, and peeled. There's a lot of useless information in this head. Believe me. Uh, no, because it's still in a range. Okay, so fuel. Would I hear you? It looks like it's trying to break out the range, but it would actually have to bust out this range decisively, and then possibly on a pullback. F cell is next. F cell. F C E O. Oh, that's what we're looking at now. Did we look at fuel yet? F U E L. Fuel F F U E L. All right, what, what am I doing wrong? F U E L. There it is. No, who asked about that? You're gonna get kicked out of here. Who asked about that? You're, you jerking my chain?
<laughs> Just tell me you want to short it. Tell me you want to short it. I'll kick you out quickly. No, I never kick anybody out. I've got a few people I like to kick out. But I'm not going to kick them out. <laughs> Um, no, I mean, it's in a downtrend. It's kind of going sideways quite a while in here, but a possible short. MCUR, MCUR, a lot of good, uh, questions today. Um, yeah, but it's already kind of come back up in here. Uh, but yeah, it is definitely, it has triggered as a breakout type of strategy. So it, it looks okay. Uh, let me, yeah, but you would already be long this from about a point ago or two. Uh, it, it's not really set up now, so I guess I would throw this in the breakout and then pullback category. MSN, what is that? MSN, oh, Emerson. Emerson. Uh, no, it's too crazy. It went straight up. I call it a bottle rocket. It went from 160 to 30 overnight. It's just all over the place and went straight up, so no, absolutely not. T-W-O-U, T-W-O-U, T. -W -O -U, T -W -O -U. Okay. Not bad. Um, I prefer these wide range bars to be f be further into the trend, which would ex which would suggest some acceleration. It's not bad though. It's it's wide and loose, but it's an IPO. It's pulling. It's taking off. For me, it needs a little tiny bit deeper pullback, but not too much. Okay. Was thinking TKO on MCUR. TKO? Yeah, it's TKO-ish. If you, if you ignore this bar here, uh, it's TKO-ish. Um, I hear you. Here's the deal. In IPOs, breakouts work a heck of a lot better than anywhere else. So, I mean, if you've got a plan in place, maybe uh, textbook style, 975, 850, uh, entry stop, it could work. I hear you, John. HTCH, starting out from... The 20, yeah, it looks okay. Um, ugh. Yeah, but I don't like this This straight up. It's a little too much. I mean, once, once you're long, it's good for it to do that. Okay. LRAD. LRAD. Yeah, that's one in the list here. Um, it's a pretty... Exp it, it's a pretty massive move higher. It's pretty thin, but I hear you. But it's going to have to pull back a little bit more, maybe. BP short. Well, you don't want to be shorting too much now. Okay. Yeah, it's BP. Um, that's not bad. But you got to realize that energy is at or near a new high, so you're kind of fighting the overall sector. I mean, that's where the obsessed before, not afterwards comes in. It's not bad. It's it's too many days of the pullback for my liking, but I hear you. And it looks, it, it's not bad. I can't get, I can't say good, <laughs> but not certainly not bad. Rex, that sounds like a, a gold stock. No, it's chemicals. Um, yeah, maybe on a pullback. I mean, it's trending. It had a gap higher yesterday. It's going to close at all-time highs. Maybe at a pullback. Oh, let's not forget. Don wants to know about Ford. Uh, it still looks like it's in trouble. It's just kind of chopping sideways, though, as of late. Uh, I wouldn't do anything with Ford. MNDL for John. MNDL. MNDL. Um, hmm. Maybe a little bit deeper pullback. That's a pretty serious breakout it's got there. It's got there. That's your friend, the wood chipper. Yeah, a little bit deeper pullback on that one. Dave, you think future spread trading has an edge in the current markets? Oh, I don't know. Um, I'm not a big fan of any type of spread trading. Uh, just uh, too many moving parts, and ugh, it's not—it's not my style. I'd rather pick—I'd rather pick a stock and watch it go up a bunch. 
ENPH, that's going to be a solo stock. Um, it's not bad. Maybe on a little bit more pullback. I mean, the only problem is I don't like the – I'm not seeing any acceleration in this breakout, but it's not, it's not bad. Well, a little bit. This wide range bar higher, a little gap here. That's okay. So on a tiny bit more of a pullback, maybe, but not pullback enough just yet. TKMR, 20 EMA stop. TKMR, that's an IPO. It was an IPO. Yeah, so far so good on that one. But if you're long, stay long, as it sounds like you are. I don't like the the possible overhead uh, supply back here. But teach its own. Okay, we're looks like we're not going to make them all today. Let's see, EBR. Let me find an unfamiliar name. Uh, no, I don't like the way it just kind of shot back up to its prior highs in here. Um, it would have to break out past them decisively and then pull back. But yeah, maybe then it might be worthwhile. Let me let me get to someone who hasn't been answered yet. What about when? VTI, VTTI. The TTI. None of those little IPOs. Uh, on a pullback, sure. But, well, yeah, it's okay. I mean, it's got a few points of rally in it. Uh, Percentage-wise, too, it looks pretty good. WMS. Um, yeah, this is one that I've, that I've been watching and actually triggered on this day here around 16, but next pullback, yeah, absolutely. MNDL, we look at that one? I think we did. MNDL. Yeah, what did I say? Whatever I said earlier. Maybe a little bit deeper pullback. Okay. Well, it looks like we're running out of time here. We have plenty. Of ran We've already ran out of time. So let's go ahead and wrap things up. Um, I love these shows. I have a blast doing them, as you can tell. Thank you guys for taking time on your busy schedule to be here. Uh, any unanswered questions, Dave at DaveLandry.com. If we don't talk again, everybody have a fantastic weekend. Thanks again so much.